Hi, it's Dwyer of DwyerCrime.blog and of KeepingItFree.blogspot.com. This is part two of the video where we take a look at the Zodiac Killer and ask ourselves the question posed by the series on Peacock that asked the question of whether there was a Zodiac Killer. Right, so let's dive into it. First, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me also point out that Zodiac is one of those special serial killers who has spawned an online community. And in that online community, several sleuths, and I salute all of them, right? The public needs to investigate these crimes independently of law enforcement. Several public sleuths have different suspects who they believe are the Zodiac. And of course, they go through the timeline and they'll point out that certain murders took place in certain places that their suspect had access to. Right? Let's talk about it. But first, a couple of things. I'm deliberately wearing different clothing than the first video. And the reason I'm doing so is to emphasize the fact that I don't believe the Lake Berryessa murder was done by the same person who killed David Faraday, Betty Lou Jensen, or Darlene Farron, right? Understand that murderer or murderers is brazen, right? Let's also correct an inaccuracy from the first video because I transposed two locations. Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen are killed on Lake Herman Road. Right, literally right off a road. Right, understand the killing so brazen that someone drives by when the second car is there, the second car that had the killer or killers in it. Right, the second car is there next to Faraday's Rambler station wagon. Then, of course, that person travels a little bit and is still within earshot when he hears what he thinks is a gunshot. That's how brazen the killer is. Right? The killer is in a situation where cars are passing. No one sees anyone in a mask, a costume, nothing like that. Right? Understand, too, a woman drives by within minutes of the murder and sees a body. Right? So that first killing on Lake Herman Road is done by someone who is brazen. Well, the second killing is the most brazen of all. Right? Because you have Darlene Farron in a car with Michael Magoo and someone walks from the car in back of them with a gun and a flashlight that may have been attached to the gun. The young people, Farron and Magoo, think it's a cop. The person walks over, doesn't run over, walks over to the passenger side of the car where Magoo is, immediately starts firing. Then as he's leaving, we know it's a he because Magoo survives the attack. Darlene Ferrin does not. But as the killer is leaving, Magoo starts moaning. So the killer, who, as far as we know, isn't even wearing a cap, the killer comes back to the car 
and fires more shots into the car. So let's stop for a moment. How would you characterize the personality type? I would say brazen. Let me go one step further. That second murder to me looks professional, right? This killer knows where this car with these two are going to be the night of July 4th, right? It's after midnight now, so it's the morning of July 5th. But understand, this killer is either a lucky predator who's looking for someone to kill, or he's a hunter, and he's hunting either Farron or Magoo. Right? And understand, too, this killer brazen. So now we get the fallout. Because after, and this is the first time it's happened in the case, after the Farron McGrew shooting early in the morning on July 5th, the killer decides to call the police. If you believe it's the killer who makes the call and not someone who hired the killer. Right? As I mentioned before, Darlene Farron was married twice. She was married at the time she's with Michael Magoo. Right? We don't know Magoo's background, but he also might have a colorful background where someone may have wanted to send some kind of message. We're here assuming that learning that Theron's current husband, who she was married to, uh, who was off at work someplace, couldn't have had a hand in this murder, right? Farron's first husband, of course, ends up with a criminal record somewhere along the line, right? He is on the show, Myth of the Zodiac Killer, and he uh, says on camera that the reason he decided to divorce Darlene Farron was because she was too fond of other men. And so just to understand, that killing takes place, then someone with knowledge of the fact that the killing takes place or took place calls police, does not call themselves the Zodiac. But in the phone call, the caller says that he's also responsible for the killing of the kids last year, presumably the Lake Herman Road victims, Faraday and Jensen. But folks need to understand the purpose of that call may have been to mislead the police, right? The purpose of that call may have been to refer to some well-known crime that took place earlier that had no bearing on the second crime. So then, of course, we get the letters. Now understand, you're two events in. The Lake Herman Road event, where two people are killed, and the Blue Springs Rock event, where two people are shot and one person dies. You're two events in, you're three murders in, there is a witness who survived one of the attacks and who looked at the shooter. And all of this takes place before you get the first three Zodiac letters, which are sent together on July 31st of 1969. Understand, the first two killings took place in December of 68. So this is more than half a year later. 
And of course, the letters don't come out for more than three weeks after the second event where Darlene Farron is killed and Michael Magoo or Majo, however you pronounce it, survives. So then we get the letters, the set of three letters with the big puzzle does not identify the killer as the Zodiac, right? These are three letters sent to three different media outlets. Obviously, whoever sent the letters wanted a media commotion. But let's be clear here. Those sketches of the Zodiac that are in the public folklore did not exist. Did not exist. When these letters go out after three people are killed in two separate instances, right, on July 31st. So then we get the August 4th letter, right? And understand, it's the August 4th letter sent just five days after the July 31st letter, right? Think about it, where the letter writer starts using the word Zodiac. So let's get to the next incident, which takes place at Lake Berryessa. And I just need to have people understand that by this point, multiple San Francisco newspapers have received letters from the Zodiac, right? The first three he sends to different newspapers. As you can imagine, the Zodiac is all over the newspaper. Newspaper readers in the Bay Area can see his handwriting. They can copy his handwriting. They can teach themselves his handwriting. Right? Just understand that. Understand, too, that the actual letters are written in blue felt. But the 60s are a black and white newspaper era, right? So in the paper, it's in black and white. If you have the actual letter, it's in blue felt. So then we get to a killing from someone who's not brazen, from someone who no doubt had a fantasy right, may have been sexually repressed. We'll talk about why I think I know that, right? Understand too, and this is important. Michael Magoo, and granted, it's decades later, is shown a picture of Arthur Lay Allen. And he made the claim that it was Arthur Lay Allen, who shot at him and Darlene Farron, right? What I want people to realize here is that the person who does the stabbing, and it's not shooting, the stabbing at Lake Berryessa is actually bigger than Arthur Lay Allen. Right? There is a big difference between someone who, let's say, is 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and someone who's a six-footer. What I want people to do is to review carefully the interviews given by the survivor of the Lake Berryessa stabbing attack. 
right? How he describes the size of the person who did the stabbing. What I want people to also realize is that the Lake Berryessa person leaves forensic evidence. There are footprints. The cops were able to figure out the weight of the person, right? And the person is supposed to be heavier than Arthur Lay Allen, right? Now, I'm not saying that Allen necessarily did the Darlene Ferrin murder, right? What I am saying is that the survivor identified saw, identified Arthur Lay Allen years later, right? Even before he identifies Arthur Lay Allen, he describes the shooter, right? Because they see the shooter walk up to the car. He describes the shooter to investigators. Just understand that there is a size gap between the shooter of Darlene Ferrin and whoever does the stabbing at Lake Berryessa. Let's also talk about the timing gap, right? You don't just have a shift away from a gun to a knife, right? But you have a bigger shift. It's a time shift. The first murder, the Lake Herman murders, Faraday and Jensen, that's 11 o'clock at night, roughly. Right? 11 at night, it's dark out. You're by a road. Easy getaway. Right? The Darlene Ferrin murder is after midnight. Again, it's dark out, right? They're in a bit of a parking lot. Easy getaway. Now here, Lake Berryessa, that stabbing's in the middle of the day. Also, understand, there's no hint with the first two events, the Faraday-Jensen event or the Darlene Ferrin event, that the person is wearing a disguise of any kind. Understand, the first letter doesn't go out with the logo. It, it doesn't go out until weeks after the Darlene Ferrin murder, right? There is no logo when the first three people are killed. No logo. Now suddenly, for the Lake Berryessa murder, the guy has on an outfit with the logo. Now here's what we know and what's important here is that it's the women involved who sense that something is wrong. So you have a group of three college-age women, right? Three college women. In other words, they're old enough to vote. They're old enough to talk to police as adults. They're on a blanket. They're just catching some sun. And they notice a guy watching them from the trees. It spooks them. When they turn around again, the guy is hiding behind a different tree. Now what's important here is that the guy looks nothing like, nothing like the person who apparently kills Paul Stein and then walks right by two San Francisco police officers. 
right? Understand, several people saw that guy. You had the young kids who call it in. They see him in Paul Stein's cab, and they call it in. They're young teenagers, right? And they call it in to police. They assist in the drawing of the sketch. They even assist in updating the sketch. Understand, too, that person leaves Paul Stein's cab, and that person walks right by two policemen who are coming to the scene and who were wrongly told in one of the biggest police mistakes in Bay Area history that the shooter was a black man, right? So understand, those cops were shown the sketch and had input, were able to comment on whether the sketch matched the guy they saw. So I need for people to understand that both the sketch from Lake Berryessa, in which not only the three college girls were able to help look at the sketch and say, yeah, that's how the guy looked, but also the stabbed victim who was alive for hours before she died, right? She had the opportunity and did speak with law enforcement. Understand, you have at least four women as well as the survivor, the guy, Brian, you have multiple people helping to come up with the Lake Berryessa sketch. Well, folks, understand, even though both sketches, right? In fact, there are three sketches. There are two from Paul Stein, right? The initial one that gets updated by everyone. And the Lake Berryessa sketch. Understand, both of those sketches were created with the help of multiple people. And of course, they are two different people. The jaw does not match up. The forehead does not match up. And of course, we know the size of the Lake Berryessa guy doesn't match the killer of Paul Stein or the killer of Darlene Farron. Let me uh, just say a few more things here because it's very important. So the guy is looking at the women, the college girls who are in a different location than the woman who gets killed and uh, the guy she's with, who you should know, later becomes a lawyer. In other words, understand, the crowd at Lake Berryessa is overeducated, right? Just understand that. They're overeducated. They're observant. They're, sh they're not young teens as was the case with the people who called in the Paul Stein murder, right? These are educated people, voting age people at Lake Berryessa. And they saw someone who does not match the sketch from San Francisco, right? Now, let me uh, just say, that the woman who's killed, and I know some people here online have made a lot of this, Cecilia Shepard, right? She stabbed up this killer, by the way, after, you know, putting on the hood. Then coming forward, he has a gun. He has a knife. He does something that the killers of the first three victims did not do. He starts talking to them. He has some ridiculous story about being a prison escapee. I'm not kidding. 
He tells them, look, and this is part of the fantasy, I'm sure. He has zip ties. He tells them, if you cooperate with me, then you'll be all right. Right? He claims he's just looking for a car because he needs to get away. And, of course, Brian Hartnell, the guy, says to him, hey, you know, I have some money on me and you can have my car. The guy doesn't take him up on the offer. So after he has Cecilia tie up Brian, and after he ties up Cecilia, he then starts stabbing them. Now I know people, hardcore sleuth types, will point out that Cecilia is older than Brian. Right? Just like Darlene Farron was older than Michael Magoo. Right, folks? I believe that's happenstance. I believe Lake Berryessa is a crime of opportunity. How do we know that? Because Cecilia Shepard sees this guy over by the trees, just like the other three women did earlier. Right? Understand how spooked the three college women were. They saw the guy the first time they look behind them and the guy is gone. They end their afternoon. They grab the blanket. They head to the car. The guy spooked them that much. So then the guy, of course, has moved away from the three. He must have realized that the third person would have made it more difficult. And then he starts looking at Cecilia Shepard and Brian. Right? But understand, he doesn't have the mask on. Not with the three women from the trees he thinks he's hiding. Not from Cecilia and Brian. But when he puts the mask on, they know it's him. Understand, the mask was so flimsy that some of his hair was sticking out of the mask. So let's understand this crime in total. This is someone who, inspired by the letters, right? This is the first murder that happens after Zodiac has written four letters, right? The first batch of three sent out July 31st, and then the next letter on August 4th, right? So this is the first murder after that. And this stabber, Right, stabs up these kids, then walks away, wearing a headset that has the Zodiac sign on it. Right, this person wants to blame the Zodiac killer. So, Brian has a white gear that he drove that we know this person pulls up behind, right? Well, just understand that the person then writes on the car door in the Zodiac's handwriting, but understand not a lot is written. The date of the first murder he writes July 4th for the date of the Darren Farron murder. And keep in mind, she's technically murdered July 5th after midnight. And then he puts the date of the Lake Berryessa event and the time. Right, folks, this is not, in my opinion, the brazen soul who killed three people before this. It's not the murderer or murder or murderers, right? Let's remember, 
There are bullets on both sides. Well, put it this way. There's at least one bullet shell on both sides of where the killer's car was parked at Lake Herman Road. Right? Whoever does Lake Berryessa is not the person or persons who did the Lake Herman Road shooting of Faraday and Jensen, nor is it the cold-blooded, possibly professional assassin who kills Darren Farron and who's able to hide his identity with a flashlight. I mean, understand, while the first guy is staring at the couple and then, you know, uh, puts on a costume, just understand that the killer who kills Dee Farron, Darlene Farron, her friends called her D. Right? When the car pulls up, that person is quickly out of the car. The person's so quick in getting out of the car that the kids think it's a cop. Right? That person is firing bullets just seconds after getting out of their car. He's not having conversations with them, coming up with some cockamamie story about needing a car and being a prison escapee. How would that help an actual prison escapee if you're on the run and then you're telling people that you're a prison escapee and you need a car? Well, what's important for our purposes here is the comparison of the sketches of the killer at Lake Berryessa and the sketches that come out of the Paul Stein murder. Folks, they're different people. Let me point out, too, that the killer at Lake Berryessa, right, of course, a phone call is made after the murders. Right? He's just following a script, isn't he? He's just following what the Zodiac did before. Let me also say, too, that when a policeman, a park ranger, comes upon Brian, who survives, right, who crawls over to the road, Brian thought that that ranger, I believe his name's Dennis Land, was the same guy who attacked them, or at least the same size, right? Now, that was Brian's initial thought. Then he understood he was with law enforcement. But what I want people to do is to look at the size of Dennis Land and compare that size to Arthur Lay Allen. right? If the men were different sizes, then whoever did the Darlene Farron murder was a different person than the person who did the murder at Lake Berryessa. Now let's talk about the Paul Stein murder. Let me just say that the Paul Stein murder is infamous because, of course, here you have the killer taking a trophy. Right? You, you have the killer taking part of Paul Stein's shirt. And you have that killer enclosing parts of the shirt in future letters. Right? Okay. Okay. Fair enough. But let's ask a basic foundational question. Given that several people saw the killer, Right? Was that the same killer who did the Lake Berryessa murder? Couldn't be. Because the sketches don't match up. Just understand that if the Paul Stein murderer, and again, the sketch is worked on by numerous people, if the Paul Stein murderer who takes out a gun and shoots Paul Stein in his cab, 
right? If that murderer, who leaves a bloody fingerprint, by the way, in the cab, that's the worst kind of forensic evidence someone could leave, right? Because the fingerprint would not only match you, but because it's bloody, you would have had to have been in the car when the person's bleeding, right? But I need for people to understand that the person who kills Paul Stein may not have even thought of themselves as having done the Lake Berryessa murder. How do we know this? Because there's no reference of Lake Berryessa. Right? Understand, after the Lake Berryessa murder, there's no Lake Berryessa letter. Right? Ask yourself, too. The Lake Berryessa murderer is so conscious of being discovered that he has on a mask as he's talking to these kids. Right? Then he, then he walks off as he's talking to these young adults. Then he walks off, right? We're supposed to believe that the Paul Stein killer sticks around the cab. The young kids who call in the murder to police do so while they're watching him work Paul Stein's body. This guy sticks around long enough to cut off part of Paul Stein's shirt. Right? I'm just telling you that I don't believe the Paul Stein killer did the Lake Berryessa murder. Right? What I want people to do, too, is to think about where Vallejo is located. Think about where San Francisco is located. I'm just telling you, people in the Bay Area know that's a long distance away. Why do we think that the sketch from San Francisco has anything whatsoever to do with the murders that took place in the Vallejo area. Right, folks, as you know, you have to do some driving. <laughs> you, have to, you have to do some driving to get to Vallejo from San Francisco. Why do we think that a murderer who is calm enough to walk by police first do a killing in an upscale Presidio Heights neighborhood in San Francisco and then feels so at home that he's hanging around the cab, right? Leaves his card, right? With the Zodiac symbol on it in the cab, tears off the shirt, now, the person who writes the letter and encloses the shirt likely killed Paul Stein, or at least knew someone who killed Paul Stein. I don't question that. What I question is the connection of that killing to any other killing. I understand, too, that the cat's out of the bag. Once the press published a Zodiac letter, then of course, then of course, people could see the handwriting. People could figure out how to duplicate it. By the way, did you know the handwriting changes over time? On the myth of the Zodiac killer, they do a great job giving the letters to two artificial intelligence investigators who help crack the QAnon situation. And they point out that the only letters to them that look legit, and of course, Horan believes this as well, are the first four. Those are the letters before the Paul Stein murders. Right, the three on July 31st and the one on August 4th. 
And of course, using AI, how were they able to do this? By looking at the word pattern, by looking at how the sentences were framed, by looking at the use of the word the and other words. Right, simply put, by the time you get to the Paul Stein letter that includes part of Paul Stein's shirt, you're dealing with someone who did not write the first four letters. You're dealing with someone who's very different, very different than the person who killed Darlene Farron, right? Understand, I'm going to talk about that crime here more than the Faraday Jensen crime because that crime has a survivor. So we can say definitively that that killer pulls up in the car behind them, gets out of the car moments later, walks over to the passenger side of the car and immediately starts firing. This is David Berkowitz type stuff. Then he starts to walk away, no costume, just a flashlight and a gun. Then he starts to walk away. Here's one of the victims moan. Then he turns back around. He's not there to hurt people. He's there to kill people. And he's efficient fires two more times into the car. He's not sticking around to pick up shells. He's not in the car leaving a card. His fingerprints are never in the car because it's surgical. All the shots are from outside of the car. Then he's gone. Right? Folks, the Paul Stein killer is different, isn't it? The Paul Stein killer is hanging around the car. He's touching the body. He's moving the body. Right? He gets out of the car. Now, just understand, it couldn't have been a black guy. Because by the Paul Stein murder, you already have a survivor of one of these attacks. Michael Magoo who saw a white guy, right? If the Paul Stein killer were a black guy, he wouldn't be able to say, hey, I'm the Zodiac, the same person who wrote the previous four letters. Let's go one step further. The Paul Stein killer couldn't have been a woman because there's already a survivor who saw a guy. The Paul Stein killer couldn't have been a thin white man. The Paul Stein killer couldn't have been a 6'11", 7' foot white man like Joker in basketball because that wouldn't match the surviving witness's testimony. Right? Understand, too, I've deliberately ignored Lake Berryessa, where you have another surviving witness. Right? But Lake Berryessa isn't referenced in any of the letters, right? Because the letters predate Lake Berryessa. And with Lake Berryessa, too many people saw that person. So just, just understand, the person who does the Paul Stein killing necessarily had to be stocky, right? Because the Lake Berryessa person is stocky. Because the killer of Darlene Farron is a little pudgy like Arthur Lay Allen was pudgy. So whoever did the Paul Stein killing had to be someone who was stocky and who thought that his look would be able to have police off his trail trying to match him to the other killings. Understand the benefit of pretending to be the Lake Berryessa killer, right? If the world thinks that the Lake Berryessa killer killed Paul Stein, then if I'm the actual killer of Paul Stein, if I have an alibi 
for the Lake Berryessa murder. Let's say I was in church or let's say I was meeting with friends at some public place. Then that would drop me down the list, wouldn't it? Right? And so just to understand, things get messy after the Paul Stein murder. Right? Understand, too, there are people who live in Solano County. There are people who live in Vallejo who hang around San Francisco. I'm not saying there's not. Right? But what I am saying is the Paul Stein killer knows San Francisco, doesn't he? He's a passenger in Paul Stein's cab. He's telling Paul Stein where to go. He has Paul Stein go to a place. <clears throat> this is choking me up. He has Paul Stein go to a place where he knows he can kill Paul Stein. Hang around the cab. Take the time to cut off part of Paul Stein's shirt. Think about how ridiculous it is, too. He shoots Paul Stein around the head area. You can imagine how bloody it is. And yet this guy's hanging around the cab. He's hanging around a bloody scene. He's close to the blood because he leaves a bloody fingerprint. He's hanging around the scene so much that kids hear the noise. Then kids look out the window and kids see him around the body. Then they call police. Understand, the police get there quickly. They just think they're looking for a black guy. Nobody at the time thought this was in any way related to the Zodiac. Let me also point out, too, isn't something wrong with the timing of the letters? Not just the crime doesn't fit the first two, where it's a quick murder, right? You know, where in the Darlene Ferrin case, where we have a survivor, right? That brazen person comes in, you know, bang, 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 is walking away, comes back, bang, 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 leaves. That's the involvement, right? Isn't this different? Where the guy's around a bloody body, and he's lingering so much in a city with an active police force. SFPD is no joke. Right? He's hanging around the body. He's cutting off part of the shirt. Had a cop seen him, would there be any explanation? Well, just understand. More than three weeks pass after Darlene Farron gets killed before you get Zodiac letters. Here, Paul Stein is killed on October 11th, 1969. And you get a letter shortly thereafter, right? Let me also point out too, the killings take place not at 11, not after 12, but at 9.55 p.m. when a lot of people are out in San Francisco. Right, so I'll concede the killer of Paul Stein is a daredevil. He's the kind of daredevil who can walk by the police. He's not in a rush. He doesn't draw attention to himself when he knows that the cops are responding to a brutal murder, a cabbie getting shot. Right, I'll agree the October 11th person is a daredevil. But here again, the description He's supposed to be 5'10". He's supposed to have reddish brown hair. He's supposed to be not over 200 pounds, like Lake Berryessa, which takes place shortly before Paul Stein. But no, he's supposed to be 180 to 200 pounds. Right? Big difference between 5'10", 180 and whoever did the Lake Berryessa murder, right? Understand, too, the brazen killer or killers who do the first three murders, right? Faraday, Jensen, Farron, right? They're not leaving anything at the murder scene. 
This isn't some celebrity fest for them. Right? I'll concede. After the Farron murder, somebody calls police. Somebody to throw police off the scent says, you know, hey, I, I killed the kids last year. It's the letter writer. Perhaps not the murderer of the first three people. Who knows the details of the first murder, the first set of murders, right? Faraday and Jensen, and the third murder, right? It's the letter writer. It might not be the actual killers, right? The killer of Darlene Farron, if that person is the person who made the call. And I understand there's a reference to calls in Zodiac letters. But if that killer is the person who made the call, if it's not a murder for hire or some associate of the killer, if it's the killer who makes the call, understand on the call, the killer doesn't give a lot of details about the kids who were killed last year. That comes out in the letters. Right, the big question here is, how did the letter writer get to know the details? Because it's that letter writer's inside knowledge of the type of bullets used in let's say the Faraday Jensen murders that gives the idea of one person being the Zodiac any kind of gravity. When you and I understand that that information could have been leaked to them from law enforcement, maybe dirty cops, maybe you have investigative types researching the crimes, finding out the facts of the crimes, and then piecing it together in letters. Right? Someone getting inside information. The point, though, is the person who wrote the letters might not necessarily be the person or people who did the crimes, right? Let me say, too, the killing that bothers me the most, quite frankly, is the first killing. Now, understand you have two teens in a car, Faraday and Jensen. Right, the shooting's overdone. Someone is shooting into the back of Faraday's station wagon. Right, makes no sense. What are they trying to do? Scare them or kill them? Right, a shot hits the roof. Now, Betty Lou Jensen, who's in the passenger side of the car, Right, somehow is able to get out of the car and start running. This is a terrified 16-year-old. Now, if she's running away, why would the killer be determined, and I mean determined, to kill her? Right, she's hit in the back multiple times, something like five times. Right? Is it possible that she knew the killer? Right? Did you reach a point here where some guy, maybe some women, maybe a couple, a guy and a girl, show up, start shooting into the car, right? Because the shots don't seem all aimed as kill shots. Faraday is killed right by the car, right, right by the car. Um, why kill Betty if it's strangers? Is there the fear that she might be able to tell the cops the license plate on the second car? But even that's a reach, isn't it? Right, so I get the feeling 
that the killers of the kids know the kids. That's my feeling. The second killing, the Darlene Farron murder. Folks, that's a professional. Right? Understand, uh, we're supposed to believe that the fact that neither husband can be proven to have been in the immediate vicinity somehow vindicates them. Right, folks, that's a professional killer. You've got to be kidding me. Right, the car, by the way, there's a car behind them. A car stops by earlier and then leaves. Right, we know this, again, because Michael Magoo survived everything. Then, either the car returns or it's a second car. Right, we don't know. But what we do know is the person in the second car gets out and then starts firing into the passenger side. Folks, it's just very professionally done. Right? They have it so that the guy walks right up like a cop would. Right? They have it so the guy walks up to the door with the guy. Right? Right by the door. Because if someone's going to have a gun statistically, back then it was more likely to be the male passenger. Right, that second event looks like a pro. The third event looks like an incel, right? Looks like someone afraid of women, right? He sees three college girls. The only way he can get close to them is by staying in the trees and looking at them, right? Understand, he shows up at Lake Berryessa. He has ties. He has a gun. He has a huge knife. He has a costume. But yet he's in the trees without the costume, looking at people. That's an amateur. Right then, of course, the three women leave. So he goes to the next group and he has some ridiculous story that an actual prison escapee wouldn't be telling people. Right. If you walk up to two unarmed people and you have a gun, the guy has a gun on him. You have a gun. Hey, player, you can tell me whatever you want. I don't need your biography. I don't need some ridiculous story about you, you know, being upset or escaping prison and stuff like that. Also, Lake Berryessa is in the middle of nowhere. Right? You're walking through Lake Berryessa, and I'm supposed to believe you didn't get here by car? Worse yet, he needed courage. This isn't the killer who shows up and starts firing. This is the guy who shows up and then has some ridiculous ritual where everyone has to be tied up. Right, folks, the Lake Berryessa killer is almost certainly not the Paul Stein murderer. Right, understand, after he stabs the kids, he doesn't take any souvenirs. He's so desperate to have you think that it's the Zodiac that rather than just leave and then call the cops from some payphone miles away, this guy has to stop by the car and write stuff on the side of the car. He even gets the date wrong for the Darlene Farron murder. Right? He says July 4th. It's actually the morning of July 5th. I believe that's significant because the guy puts the time of his stabbing at Lake Berryessa on that car door. He's trying to be precise, right? He's writing in black ink, not blue ink, because he read about the Zodiac in the paper and he doesn't know that the Zodiac uses blue ink. Now, if you reach the conclusion that the Lake Berryessa killer and the Paul Stein killer are just claiming to be Zodiac for publicity, maybe narcissism, or to throw off the cops, then just understand the Zodiac killer might never have existed. 
right? The, the word Zodiac is not used until weeks after the Darlene Farron murder, right? The August 4th, the August 4th letter is when the word Zodiac is used, right? The letters that go out July 31st, they don't refer to the Zodiac. They have some ridiculous puzzle in them. And understand you had a lot of people with military experience back then, and a lot of code breakers back then, right? This is an era when you had a draft. You have some ridiculous code that someone was able to break. And of course, the solution to all the code did not have the word Zodiac in it. Right, so I believe the same person writes the three letters on July 31st and the August 4th letter. I believe some frustrated soul reads about it in the paper, has his own fantasy about stabbing some people to death, right, comes up with a costume, practices the handwriting, doesn't realize it's supposed to be in blue. And keep in mind, it matters because the guy thought through this enough to bring a marker with him to an event where he kills, excuse me, he stabs two people. Right? Is being a peeping Tom for three other people. If he's planned this out enough to have an elaborate hood mask, and to bring a marker, then you understand with that much effort, someone in the know would have had a blue marker, not a black marker. Right? So this is a guy who is afraid of women. Right? There's a sexual component to Lake Berryessa that you simply don't have, in my opinion at least, in the first two events. The one on Lake Herman Road, Faraday, Jensen. The one on Blue Springs Rock. I think that's it. Um, Theron and Magoo. Right? Lake Berryessa, folks, that's different. The fact that Cecilia Shepard happens to be older than the guy she's with, like Theron, was older than Michael. It's just happenstance. We know it's just happenstance because this guy was leering at three college-age women who then were able to leave as a group. He didn't want to approach the group. He needed the element of surprise. Right? He's so amateurish that Cecilia and Brian saw him hiding behind trees before he puts on the headset. And again, it's so light, his hair came through the fabric, right? He puts on the headset, then he walks over. Just look at the jawbone from the sketch that's made after the Lake Berryessa murders. It does not match the famous sketches made after the Paul Stein killing. Just to understand all these people online who are looking at those sketches and who are then saying, hey, this guy, Lawrence Kane, could have been the Zodiac, right? Just look at him here and look at these sketches and stuff like that. Just understand, you're looking at sketches that were not made until the fourth murder. We're calling the guy, we're calling the guy the Zodiac Killer. That term wasn't used by the killer or killers until three people were dead. Right? Think about it. Anyway, that's how I see it. 
Let me hear from you. In fact, Paul Stein would have been the fifth person killed in the series of killings. What we're finding out is it's not a series of killings. Right? You have people who may have known Faraday and Jensen do the first killing, in my opinion. Right? If it's strangers and some girl gets away and runs into the uh, woods, and these are hardcore types who've been in prison, who've already done crimes, right? They're going to look at her. They're going to say, oh, gee, she's too afraid to identify me. She doesn't know me. We're just passing through here, right? No, no, no. She's running away. They have to kill her, right? They have to kill her at that point because they've taken out guns, they've shot up Faraday's car, and she can ID him, right? The second killer, I don't think he spends his entire July 4th just randomly looking for people to kill, right? I believe that is a professional, right? Someone smart enough to know as he's walking up to the car from the back and they see him, right? As he's walking up to the car, he knows how to work the flashlight just so, so they can't make out his face. He's not even wearing a police uniform. He's that hidden without a costume to the point where Theron and Magoo thought he was a police officer. Up until he walks up to the passenger door, no conversation, just starts firing. That's not the peeping Tom incel type who's looking at three women and trying to hide behind trees and then who's hiding behind trees when he finds a couple um, on a blanket. That's a different person. Right? But by then, the letters have been published. So, of course, it's after the publication of the letters that you have killers, right? Leaving the Zodiac symbol on the side of a car door for the Lake Berryessa murders and then leaving a card with the Zodiac symbol on it in Paul Stein's cap, right? That's the first time. It's after the publication of the letters. So I'll agree. Let me close with this. I'll agree. The letter writer knows the facts of these cases. I'll agree with that. Right? A very deep question is, where did they get it from? Right? I don't think the letter writer was in all of these locations. Right? It's possible. I'm not saying that reporters uh, stole part of Paul Stein's shirt. I'm not saying that. I understand they go there in the myth of the Zodiac Killer. But what I am saying is these murders were big news. Right? Someone with access to police records perhaps a well-connected reporter, perhaps a corrupt cop who got paid some money to leak some news, perhaps a series of cops, right? Perhaps you have an investigative type who says, hey, Charlie, you were over by that Lake Herman Road uh, murder. Tell me about what happened there. Then, of course, later you say, hey, Bobby, you were there for that Darren Farron murder. Tell me what happened there. Right? And then they worked it into letters that led to crazies later doing murders and claiming to be the Zodiac. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you disagree, please use the comment section of this video to tell us why you disagree. Right? Tell us why you believe 
the brazen killers who are involved in the first two events, right? Faraday and Jensen, that's event number one, right? Farron and Magoo, I understand many pronounce it Majo, right? That's murder number two, uh, the second event, right? Tell us why you believe that brazen killer or killers did the Lake Berryessa stabbings, then later did the Paul Stein assassination, right? It's interesting too that the weapons don't match up, right? You have a 22, then you have different nine millimeters, right? You have a knife. Folks, it just doesn't work, does it? Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear your comments. Let's talk about it. Thanks for stopping by.